And my new structural economics is a continuation of those kind of rethinking within the World Bank. And for the new structural economics, I'd like to explain how come I call it new structural economics. In effect, it's an application of the neoclassic approach to understand the determination of economic structure and its evolution in an economy. And in economic profession, if you apply the neoclassic approach to study agriculture, then you should call that agricultural economics. If you apply that to study finance, it should be called financial economics. Since I apply the new neoclassic approach to study economic structure, I should call this structural economics. But to distinguish myself from the structuralism that prevailed in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, I added one thing new. And in effect, that was also the convention in economics. We know that in the 19th century, early 20th century, in the US, there are some economists called institutional economics, apply Marxist to study institution. And in the 1960s, in the Douglas North and so on, apply neoclassic approach to study the institutions. And uh, you know, Douglas North and so on, they also call new institutional economics to distinguish themselves from the old institutional economics. So that's the reason why I call new structural economics. And this new structural economics will help us understand those status effects in the Growth Commission report or in the East Asia miracles. And certainly I hope this new structural economics can help us in the development policies to achieve a better result. And I'd like to say, certainly the development economics try to understand or try to promote sustainable economic growth. But we know that sustainable economic growth is a recent phenomenon. It did not come until about 18th century. Before that, according to Madison, we know that you know, before 18th century, the average annual growth rate of per capita income in the Western European country, the most advanced country today, was about 0.05% per year. So that means what? It took 1,400 years to double per capita income. Entering into 19th century, 18th, 19th century, the rate of growth increased 20 times to 1% per year, and that took about 70 years to double per capita income. And entering into the 20th century, the rate of growth increased to 2% per year, so it took about 35 years to double per capita income. And that happened in the Western European country and North America. But the rest of the world, they have not catch up yet. And this kind of dramatic changes was possible, certainly was because of industrial revolution. The rate of technological invention, innovation accelerated. And there was a lot of literature about that. But I like to say, it's not only the technological innovation. It is also a process of structural transformation from resources-based, agriculture-based, and uh, to manufacturing sector to modern industry. And actually, the painting here already shows that. OK. And uh, this is in any country. For example, today, in the US, we know it's the modern, high-tech, capital-intensive, you know, computer, robots, and so on, research institution, Wall Street, financial centers, and so on. But even in the US, 300 years ago, just like many countries in Africa today, agrarian, based on agriculture. And uh, 100 years ago, even in New England, its industry was textile. Its industry was shoemaking. It was just like in a low-income country today. But you can see that there's a lot of structural differences in this process of modernization. 
And how come? There's such a dramatic change in economic structure that I'd like to explain in my new structural economics. And my main hypothesis is that industrial structure is a phenomenon. It's endogenous, it's determined by the changes in the country endowment structure. And what is endowment structure? Well, for economy, we know so-called endowments was the amount of capital, labor force, natural resources you have. And it's given at any specific time. It's changeable over time. And I'd like to say, economic profession, except in international trade, so far have not paid enough attention to the endowment and endowment structure. But endowment and endowment structures are so important in economic analysis. Because for any country, at any given time, the total endowments is the total budget for the nation. That's one thing. Secondly, endowment have a relative abundance of capital, natural resources, labor force. And those kind of relative abundance will determine the relative prices of capital or the labor of the natural resources. For economists, we know two of the most important parameters are total budget and the relative prices. And endowment and endowment structure determine those two most important parameters for economic analysis. But regrettably, in the development economics, we did not pay enough attention to its implication. And I hope that the new structural economics, by bringing this as a starting point, we will pay increasing attention to that. And my argument is that because endowment and endowment structure are given at any given time, it will determine your competitive advantages in the economy. What is your competitive advantage determined by your endowment structure? And uh, because the industry you have competitive advantages will be most competitive in domestic market and international market. And those kind of competitiveness determine what is the optimal industrial structure at any given time. But it's endogenous to the endowment structure. If you want to increase the income, certainly you need to have a similar industry as a high income country. But since Industrial structure is endogenous to the endowment structure. So that means that if you want to upgrade your industries, you need to upgrade your endowment first. And once your endowment is upgrade, your industry by endogeneity means they also need to upgrade. But here I like to say, I'm a little bit Marxist here. Not only your industry need to upgrade, your institution also need to upgrade. Your infrastructure also need to upgrade, just like the painting show, when they are still in a fish, fishery villages, the infrastructure is very simple. But if you come into the modern commerce, the infrastructure will be different. So that means that in the economic development process, when industry changes, you need to improve your soft infrastructure like an institution, but also hard infrastructure like port facilities. And I'd like to argue, following the competitive advantages determined by your endowment structure will make you most competitive. And if you're most competitive, you can have a lot of economic surplus. And so you have more to save to turn that into capital. At the same time, if you invest in industry which are consistent with your competitive advantages, the return to capital will be the highest. So the incentive to save will also be highest. And by that, you can accumulate capital in the fastest way. If your capital accumulate, your endowment, stru up, endowment structure upgrade, certainly your industrial structure, your income will also increase. And so by this, if you want to reach the high income status, the way to follow your competitive advantage determined by your endowment structure at any given time. But 
That is a term, follow your competitive advantages, is a term only understandable to someone like me or like you here, economist. But for people in business, they do not care about competitive advantage, they only care about profitabilities. So how do you turn the concept of following a country's competitive advantages in the process of development into a spontaneous choice of the entrepreneur? We need to have an institution. That is, you need to provide a relative prices. And those kind of relative prices reflect relative abundance of your endowments. If you are abundant in natural resources and the skills in capital, then natural resources should be relative inexpensive, capital should be relative expensive. If you are abundant in global force and skills in capitals, then capital should be relative expensive and uh, labor force workers should be relatively inexpensive. If you have those kind of price signals, then for the profitability of the firm, they will be guided by the relative price to choose the technology and industry, which can use relative inexpensive abundant factors. If you are low income country, capital is very expensive, wages is very low, and then for the profitabilities, the firm certainly will go into the labor intensive sectors and adopt labor intensive technologies. And that is consistent with your competitive advantages. And then when you become relative abundant in capital, capital become inexpensive, and wage become very expensive, then for the profitability of the firm, the firm will go into the capital intensive industry, adopt capital intensive technologies. And uh, what kind of institution can give us those kind of relative prices? The only institution can give us those kind of price signals is competitive market. Another reason why all the successful country, they're based on market economy. But if market is so important, how come we still need to have a government there? 